Good morning. If you clicked on your live stream and you expected to see Bill, well, surprise, um, Bill is doing well. He is not sick or anything. Normally after Holy Week, Bill takes a week off of preaching. And so, um, and also we've been, we've become aware um, that this live stream is being watched not just by our own congregation here in Lawrence, but actually in pockets throughout the world. And so I'm grateful to God. We're grateful to God just for his um, impact of our church as we have sent people out over the years and as they are um, watching us. And so if I have not met you personally, my name is Chad Donahoe. I'm the college pastor at Grace. And thankfully, we can live stream together, not only um, throughout Lawrence, but uh, also beyond Lawrence. Uh, but this morning, I do have my wife and my, uh, all of my children with me here in the congregation, as well as, as Bill mentioned before, throughout the pews are pictures of our congregation. So at times, if you notice that I, I have um, honed in on one particular uh, area, it's probably me just trying to apply this sermon to one of my children. So um, with that, um, regarding updates on the life of our church, uh, keep checking your email and the website. Uh, obviously, we're in tough times, so for particular needs for prayer, please email the elders. It's elders at gepc.org. And for particular needs, uh, please email Ryan Randolph. He's our, direction of con- or our director of congregational care. His email is randolph, R-A-N-D-O-L-P-H, at um, gepc.org. And as far as uh, the other stuff in the life of our church, Bible studies, life groups, prayer meetings, we are continuing those, though, through online platforms. And so if you would like to get plugged into one of those, please feel free to email me, chad at gepc.org, and I'll point you in the right direction. The worship bulletin uh, for this morning is just a click away. And you may be in your living rooms, you may be in your robes, um, but we encourage you as we worship together to worship as if we are together. So with the, uh, including the times where we stand together, we read together, and we sing together, um, I, I will give you various prompts. And so as we begin, please stand, if you are able, acknowledging that we are in the very presence of our sovereign Heavenly Father, who is infinite and yet draws near to us. And let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, thank you for giving us this day to come together as your people, to acknowledge how great you are. And as we hear your call to worship, help us to get caught up in your presence. Help us to be thoughtful about the words we sing and pray together, and the sermon that we hear and seek to apply and that you would strengthen us to bear fruit in all that you've called us to. Please use this hour to do a great work in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our call to worship is responsive from Psalm 33. Behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. And together, let's worship. Praise you, the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul. Praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, who are all things so wondrously raised. Thou not seen how all thy longings have been. 
is in me adore him all that hath life and breath come now with praises before him let the amen sound from his people again gladly forever adore him let the Our reading this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but as was made manifest in the last time for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. We are called to live holy lives, yet as Peter knew of himself, uh, we fail. And David knew that too. Thus, using this prayer that David wrote for his own sin, let us confess our sins together from Psalm 51. And together, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. And take a moment quietly and privately to confess your sins to God. And hear these words from the scriptures and be assured of sins forgiven. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. And together we say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. And please stand, and together let's sing. Thy free grace alone from the 
Zion and the covenant love of thy crucified Son. All praise to the Spirit whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon and righteousness mine. All praise to the Spirit whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon and righteousness mine. Let us profess our faith together 
using the Apostles' Creed. And together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And as we come to the dedication of our tithes and offerings, remember, we remember that this is part of our worship, and our giving is a reflection of our hearts towards God. Do we trust God enough to give generously, trusting that God will provide for us? And according to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The problem is, if we love money, we'll never have enough. But God calls us to keep our lives free from the love of money, to worship him and to trust him. And according to 2 Corinthians 9, to give cheerfully. And to that end, let's pray. Heavenly Father, keep us from the love of money, especially in these times when we fear we may not have enough. Thank you for your promise that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And based on that promise, help us to give, to give generously that you would sustain and further the work of our church, that according to Colossians 4, you would open to us doors for the gospel to be proclaimed. And according to 2 Thessalonians 3, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Our prayer is that you'll use our tithes and offerings to further your kingdom work in advancing the gospel and making disciples in Lawrence and beyond to the ends of the earth. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. So please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Where we'll be picking up in Luke's gospel is verse 14, and specifically, this is the account of the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples, and this is the night before his crucifixion. So Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 34. And let me pray for our time in the Word together. So Father, we give you thanks for the power of your Word, and I pray that you would encourage us where we need to be encouraged and convict us where we need to be convicted. I pray that you would strengthen us to live out our faith, to bear fruit in our various relationships and responsibilities. And so please open our hearts and our minds to your word that we would do your will through the power of your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on this table. For the Son of Man goes as it was determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another. Which of them it could be who was going to do this? A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. 
For who is the greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. And together, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So for the past, um, past months the, on Sunday mornings, we've been taking up various encounters with Jesus. And the way those encounters reveal hearts and the way they reveal our hearts. And this morning, I want to take up another counter with Jesus and Peter. A few months ago, uh, Bill preached on Luke chapter 5 when Jesus took Peter on quite the fishing expedition. And I also want to take up an encounter with Peter, but this one out of Luke 22, and this is for a few reasons. Um, I preached on the transformation of Peter's life back in April of 2007 here at Grace, so 13 years ago, and I wanted to rework it, and I did. I pretty much gutted that sermon. This is pretty much a whole new sermon. And part of this is I just love um, Peter in the Gospels. He gives us just so much. From what we read of Peter through the lens of the Gospels, he seems to be a bit uh, impulsive and outspoken at times. Uh, He carries a lot of personality. And you have to imagine that with the disciples, they brought a lot of personality to the table for the three years that they were with Jesus. In fact, the Gospels record that more than once, the disciples argued over who among them is the greatest. But... Then as we fast forward past the Gospels into the book of Acts, as the church is being established and growing, Luke tells us that the disciples were, and I quote, of one heart and soul. So what happened that so transformed the disciples and Peter from a fairly diverse and ragtag group with selfish ambitions to being on mission together and serving with one heart and one soul? Well, the quick answer is the power of the Holy Spirit that transforms individuals in communities of believers, along with lots of teachable moments, right? And what we'd call teachable moments. They're intended uh, to move one towards maturity and wisdom. So years ago, I had what I thought was a brilliant parenting idea. I recalled in my own teen years how when I became a teenager, beginning to believe that my parents really did not know anything about raising me at that point. And so um, I wanted to cut this off um, as quick as I could. So right at that time when one of my kids was entering into their teen years, and all of my kids at this point have entered into their teen years, so I will not reveal which, which one, though I will stare at this one the whole time that I give this illustration. So um, I talked with this child of mine. I said, okay, So, you know, your mom and I were talking with a group of our friends that all have kids around your same age, and this is a true story, and we were all laughing and lamenting about the fact that, well, when you become a teenager, your brain isn't fully developed so that you may not realize how wise we are, and you may actually think at times that we're kind of stupid. And so, um, with that, uh, that would be until you hit your mid-20s, and and beyond, and then you realize how wise we actually were, and so let's just skip all that phase. You just need to trust that your mom and I know what's best for you. Just need to trust. Pretty reasonable, right? Well, this child looks at me, and dead serious, and with as much respect as this child could give, um, says, uh, well, Dad, have you considered that Maybe you and mom and all your friends are wrong and that we do actually know what's best for us? It's like, oh, I was too late. The teen years had hit. 
So teachable moments are intended to lead us towards maturity and wisdom, but sometimes these teachable moments take a while to take root. And we see this with the disciples, and we see this in Peter's life. And in roughly three years, if you think about it, the disciples and Peter had tons of teachable moments with Jesus. And think about all that Peter experienced. Peter was there when Jesus first began his public ministry. Peter was there in the boat when Jesus um, was preaching to the crowds, and as they began to press in on him, he stepped into Peter's boat. And once he was finished speaking to the crowds, he turned his attention towards Peter and essentially said, okay, Peter, go fish. And in the most unlikely scenario, at the instruction of Jesus, Peter began to catch so many fish that he realized Jesus was no mere master teacher or master fisherman. And so what we read is that um, Peter fell to his knees and said, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And Jesus' response is, Peter, I have a plan for you. Follow me. And Peter left everything, the scriptures say, and followed Jesus. And he followed Jesus around the region uh, for years during the miracles and the teachings and the healings. Um, Peter was there in the boat when, the great, when a great storm came upon the disciples, so much so that they cry out to Jesus who was sleeping, not really threatened by that storm, but they cry out, Lord, we're going to perish, save us. Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, calms the sea, and responds, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And then Peter was there in the boat with the disciples. When Jesus came out to them walking on water, Peter himself got on that same water and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And when Jesus uh, pulled him out of the water, Jesus says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And Peter was there when Jesus multiplied the five loaves of bread and the two fish, fed 5,000. That just doesn't happen every day. And right around, uh, right at that time, based on all these teachable moments, Jesus asked his disciples one day, So who do people say that I am? And they respond, John the Baptist, Elijah, maybe one of the prophets. Jesus presses further, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter gets it right. And right after that in the Gospels, we have the story of the transfiguration. Peter was there. When Jesus went up on a high mountain, he took with him Peter, James, and John, and Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white as light. Moses and Elijah were there, just Put yourself in Peter's shoes. He sees Jesus, dazzling white, Moses and Elijah, representing all of the Old Testament, the prophets and the law, everything that pointed to the need for a Savior. And they're talking to Jesus about his departure, meaning his death, his resurrection, and his ascension that he must accomplish. And then, if that's not enough, Peter hears the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Right? This just doesn't happen every day. And so Peter exp- experienced plenty of teachable moments. So it should be easy for Peter to follow Jesus, right? God literally said to Peter, listen to Jesus, so Peter should be able to listen easily, right? But it's, as we know, it's not always that easy. Jesus called Peter to leave everything behind, but we will see that Peter still hung on to a few things, namely pride, doubt, and fear. And we see this not only in Peter's life, but in our own life with pride. Peter will continue with the disciples through the Gospels to play the who's the greatest game, right? And for Peter, before the going gets tough, Peter thinks that he has everything that he needs to to make this work in his own strength. And do we see this kind of pride or these areas of pride in our own lives? where we're seeking to be great in our own eyes or the eyes of others. Or it could be that we are really busy relying on ourselves, whereas our prayer at times is neglected. When it comes to doubt, when the going gets tough, Peter and the disciples, they had their doubts. Right? Wait, did we miss something? This isn't the kingdom of God that we uh, signed up for here. You know? And often we can share similar doubts wait, we shouldn't be suffering. Why are we struggling? Why is this so hard? Where is God in all of this? 
we share our own doubts. And when it comes to fear, when the going gets tough, Peter will become so fearful that he will deny his Lord and Savior three times in one fateful night. But do we experience these same fears? If we identify as a Christian in certain circles, what will people think? What about our social status? What about our reputation? Or it could be that at times we say, I'll just let my actions speak loud enough that I'm a Christian. But maybe it's out of fear that we don't actually, with our lips, proclaim Christ, the one who we love. Pride, doubt, and fear. We'll see how this plays out in Peter's life, but what I really want us to consider this morning is the transformation of Peter's life and what does gospel maturity look like. So we'll, uh, we'll consider this question through the lens of Peter's life and what it means for our lives. And so in Luke 22, verse 14, and when the hour came, and this was the hour to celebrate the Passover, and in a greater sense, this was the hour that would lead into Jesus' suffering and death. And Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus knows the rich significance of this meal together. The Passover was a time of remembering the Exodus, how God had powerfully delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt. But the uh, Passover was also a meal of anticipation as it pointed forward to the coming of a new exodus out of the slavery of sin. It pointed to a new coming kingdom. It pointed to Jesus who would become the Passover lamb for the salvation of his people. And during this meal, Jesus unveils its true significance. His body will be afflicted. His blood will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. And this would be their last meal together before the crucifixion. And then in verse 24, Luke tells us that a great dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Okay, to be captain obvious here, that's not good. Right? Um, if I was a betting man, I would bet the house that Peter had a dog in that fight as well. I mean, if I'm in Peter, I may be tempted to say, okay, fellow disciples, as far as who's the greatest, um, who else was given the nickname The Rock by Jesus? Yeah, pass me some bread, right? Um, you could see that Peter uh, would be tempted to uh, jump in on that one, but this wasn't the first time that the disciples were positioning themselves for greatness, right? In one account in the Gospels, um, there's, uh, these disciples are walking together, and they make it to their destination. They meet up with Jesus, and Jesus says, uh, hey, what were you all talking about on the way? And they're all silent because they're busted. They were talking about how great they were, and then Jesus, or who the greatest among them was, and then Jesus um, takes a child, and he brings the child before them, and he essentially says this, is your status greater than this child? Not in God's eyes. And in fact, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be like this child, humble, dependent, having a childlike faith. But there's another time when James and John, the sons of Zebedee, along with their mother, approached Jesus and um, asked Jesus if they can have the seats on the right and the left hand of Jesus in, the, in his kingdom that he is bringing. Now, if you're looking for a textbook definition of a helicopter parent, this is it. The other disciples were indignant. They wanted those seats. And then we have this account here. This passage we see, the same sin of pride that is alive and well among these disciples. And what's Jesus' response to this disciples' desire for greatness, their lust for greatness? Essentially this. He says, the world around you is consumed with being great and making a name for themselves, but not so with you. And that what the gospel in this account records in Matthew and Mark is Jesus' words, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
And I find it no coincidence that as the disciples are disputing over how great they are, Satan enters the scene. We see this in verse 31. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. In verse 31, the two yous, Y-O-U, are plural. It's, this is obvious in Greek, but not as obvious in our English uh, language. In other words, Jesus is telling Peter, Satan has demanded to have you all, all of you disciples, and sift you all like wheat. And this is a sobering picture, this idea of being sifted. Or we could say um, to be sifted is to be violently shaken or beaten so that the head of a grain is taken apart. That's the imagery here. It should be sobering. Because Satan's intent is to cause suffering with this goal, that one would forsake their faith in God. And there's a couple of implications I want to draw out from this, and I want to give credit here to um, a sermon on this passage by John Piper, uh, who I thought was really insightful, and I have a quote uh, that I want to share from John Piper. First implication is, yeah, Satan does have power in this world. Jesus calls him the ruler of the world in John 16. Paul calls him the God of this age in 2 Corinthians 4. And he is hell-bent, and I mean that literally, on destruction. In the book of Job, we see that he's responsible for the death of Job's children and Job's ruined health. In the parable of the sower, Jesus tells us that the, the enemy seeks to snatch the gospel from the heart. The scriptures tell us that Satan seeks to blind the minds of unbelievers so they will not see the glory of the cross. And in Revelation 12, it refers to Satan as the deceiver of the whole world and the accuser of Christians, accusing them night and day. So this should give us a seriousness to our life that non-Christians do not share with us. So on one hand, Satan does have power. On the other hand, Satan does have power, but it is limited. It is not absolute power. That belongs alone to God. And Satan is on a leash. I love how Bill put this years ago. He said, if we were to look at an organizational chart, we would not see God and Satan in this organizational chart on the same line. We would see God above and Satan below. Satan only has power by way of permission. And we see this in the book of Job when Satan asked to go after Job. And we see this also here where, G where Satan has asked to go after Peter as well. But he must ask permission. So here's the thorny question though. So why does God allow Satan to have any power at all? Here, we're jumping into the deep end of the swimming pool. Um, and I'd like to, uh, I, I like what John Piper says here. I want to quote him. It's, I think it's good and pretty succinct, succinct. He says this, It may be that this is none of our business and that we should trust the wisdom and goodness of God without an answer. Ooh. But he goes on. But I think the scriptures indirectly suggest a possible answer, which may encourage and strengthen our faith. I think the reason God permits Satan to persist in his sifting work is that in the end it will be good for the church and will bring more glory to God. It's clear from the whole New Testament that God intends to bring the bride of Christ to perfection through affliction and temptation. We must suffer with Christ if we will be glorified with him, according to Romans 8. Through suffering and trial, our faith is refined. We are drawn to rely even more heavily on God, and we are moved to cherish his grace more strongly. Satan has his role to play in fanning the flame of our refining furnace, and so God awaits the appointed day of judgment, saying that God is in control of all things, including Satan, and Satan's day is coming, that day of judgment. But until then... God can take even the worst things in our lives and apply it to strengthen our faith. And so, with, um, with all things in mind, especially in this season of coronavirus in mind, we can say this, that in Christ we have every right to say to Satan or any evil, 
You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Paraphrase of Genesis chapter 50. Neither Satan nor sickness nor sinful man is sovereign. Only God is, and he is good, and he is wise. And so what we find is Satan failed with Job. Job was tested, but strengthened in his faith. But Satan is seeking a redo with Peter to test him. And so we get to verse 32. As I read verse 32, notice the four U's here, Y-O-U, again. These this time are in the singular. They're applied to Peter. Jesus responds, But I've prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you, Peter, have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knows what lies ahead for Peter. And he prays that Peter's faith may not fail, meaning fail completely, but that when Peter turns again, and this word in the Greek has the notion of repenting, of turning back to God, but when you turn again, Peter, strengthen your brothers. Peter's response is, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death for you, Jesus. It's a bold promise. Peter does not recognize the dark days that lie ahead here. Jesus' response, Peter, you will deny me three times this very day before the rooster crows. And as the story continues, we see a sad progression. Jesus leads them out of the Garden of Gethsemane, tells his disciples to pray that they will not enter into temptation, meaning the temptation to sleep, the temptation to not stay with Jesus and support him, the temptation ultimately to fall away from Christ. And Matthew and Mark give even more detail. They say Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, Peter, you're not strong enough. Stay awake and pray. And then Jesus withdraws from them, praying that the Father, if it's will, would take this cup of wrath away from Jesus. And where's Peter? He's asleep. Darkness continues literally and figuratively. Jesus is betrayed by Judas, and there's a crowd that has gathered, been organized by the religion, religious leaders to arrest Jesus, to take him to his trial. And where's Peter now? It's interesting. Three of the Gospels use the similar language, and Peter was following at a distance. And then there's the courtyard scene when Peter denies that he knows Jesus three times, and right then the rooster crows. In verse 61 and 62, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. And so here's Peter. Three years of teachable moments. He goes from, I'm with you, Jesus, till the end, no matter what, prison or death, to following at a distance, and then to denial. And it's important for us to see that we're just not all that different from Peter. We can say, I will follow you, Lord, no matter what. And we may be sincere, but we can't do that out of our own strength. Temptations will come, and we need to heed Jesus' words. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And these temptations at times can lead us to following Christ at a distance. And even to, with our lips and our lives, deny him. And what do we need to hear from the Lord? Because we can deny the Lord out of fear at times, out of doubt at times, and we need the words of Jesus. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And O you of little faith, why did you doubt? These are the words that Jesus had said to Peter directly in certain scenarios. And so in our moments and seasons of pride or fear or doubt, our moments of having little faith, What do we need? Well, what did Peter need? What Peter needed and received and what we have received and need to be reminded of is a real hope beyond ourself so that whatever we face, coronavirus or worse, we can rest assured that we have everything we need. So what transformed Peter? It wasn't a self-help book. What transformed Peter was the grace of God through the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And what Peter received, and what we, if we are in Christ, have received, is the grace of God through the death of Christ. 
It certainly appeared that Peter was sifted by Satan, right? Peter denied Jesus. Jesus turned and looked at Peter, and Peter wept. But Jesus wasn't finished with Peter. Jesus carried out the prophecy of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, this passage, beautiful passage in the Old Testament that pointed directly to Christ. But I want to take a bit of liberty with this passage and make it personal in this way. So from Isaiah 53, Jesus was despised and rejected by men, including Peter in the courtyard. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne Peter's griefs and carried his sorrows. Yet we esteemed him, or we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But Jesus was wounded for Peter's transgressions. He was crushed for Peter's iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought Peter peace. And with his stripes, Peter was healed. Peter, like sheep, had gone astray, had turned his own way. And the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of Peter. And the beauty is, if we're in Christ... We can substitute our own name in here as well. Because in the death of Christ, he destroyed the power of Satan. He put away our sin and he opened the door for an eternal kingdom. We've received the grace of God through the death of Jesus. Not only that, we've received the grace of God through the resurrection of Jesus. What's the hope of the resurrection? It's new life. And as Peter puts it in his epistle, now listen, this is Peter Right, The Peter we see in the Gospels, a different Peter in the epistles. So from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an, inher- to an inheritance that is imperishable, undef- undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is a living hope through the resurrection. And Peter also mentioned in this passage that it's being guarded. And this takes us to the ascension of Christ. So we have received the grace of God through the death, through the resurrection, but also through the ascension of Christ. And what I want to focus on here is in the ascension, Jesus guards us through prayer And pours out the Holy Spirit. If you recall, Jesus warned Peter that Satan wanted to sift him like wheat. Jesus said, but I've prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And we see Jesus' prayers were effective. And we can draw great encouragement from this as well. Because the scriptures tell us that Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God. And what is he doing? The scriptures tell us that he is interceding for us. He's defending us. And Satan would love to sift us like wheat, but cannot if we're in Christ. And according to Romans 8, 39, hear these words. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecutions or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything in all creation, parentheses, including coronavirus and its effects, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Hebrews 7, 25 backs this up, says that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession. It is Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, interceding so that even in our darkest hours, he's got us. Our faith will not fail Because the scriptures are clear that no one can snatch us out of his hands. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. So in the beginning of this sermon, I asked the question, what does gospel maturity look like? What exactly happened that transformed Peter and the other disciples from a 
from basically a, a group of, uh, with selfish ambitions and put them on mission together with one heart and one soul. It was a lot of teachable moments, but at the heart of it is this. It's the grace of God through the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. What transformed Peter's life is God's work in his life. And then, not only that, when Jesus was ascended, besides guarding us through interceding, we also know Jesus um, poured out the Holy Spirit. We see this in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Jesus had promised his disciples that he would send another helper to be with them, the Holy Spirit. And in the book of Acts, as well as 2 Peter, we see the power of the Holy Spirit at work in and through Peter's life in powerful ways. And I want us to close with a section out of 1 Peter chapter 5. So if you could turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. This is the Peter after the Holy Spirit has grabbed hold of his life. This is the transformed Peter. I want us to see the fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit in Peter's life and to see the contrast between the Peter that we find in the Gospels and the Peter who penned these words. This, what I'm about to read, I would suggest is gospel maturity. So verse 5. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Notice, this is not Peter playing who can be the greatest game. This is a humbled Peter encouraging humility. And I want to read a section. I have uh, this book, Humility and Absolute Surrender written by Andrew Murray in 1859. And he writes uh, in one of his chapters, uh, in a lot of this, he writes about uh, Peter's humility and, and the humility that we, that we uh, the humility that comes to us as we follow Christ and see him and his humility. And here's what he writes. I want to take a few sentences here. Since it's easy to think we humble ourselves before God, but humility towards men will be the only sufficient proof that our humility before God is real. The humble man feels no jealousy or envy. He can praise God when others are preferred and blessed before him. He can bear to hear others praised and himself forgotten, because in God's presence he has learned to say with Paul, I am nothing. He has received the spirit of Jesus, who pleased not himself and sought not his own answer. And then listen to this section of what it says about fellow Christians. Amid what are considered the temptations to impatience and touchiness, to hard thoughts and sharp words, which come from the failings and sins of fellow Christians, the humble man carries the oft-repeated injunction in his heart and shows it in his life. And then he quotes Colossians 3, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, even as the Lord forgave you. Let us look upon every brother who tries or vexes us as God's means of grace, God's instrument for our purification, for our exercise in the humility Jesus, our life, breathes within us. So if we catch what he's saying, all things, all things, whether it is um, the harshness or an action done at another Christian towards us, or whether it's just jealousy or envy we feel towards someone else. God uses all things and can use all things as a gift to us. And we're called to receive this as a gift towards our humility. In verse 7, Peter goes on. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So when you think about Peter, the times where he may have been anxious, there's one that comes to my mind. It's the time where... He seeks to walk on the water, begins to sink. Surely that is an anxious moment, right? And then Peter, what does he immediately do? He cries out to the Lord, Lord, save me. And here's what I want to do. And this is for the kiddos who are at home watching this. I have a multiple choice. Let me give you A, B, C, and D. Of what did Jesus do immediately after Peter cried out to him? 
Did he, A, immediately give him the palm of his hand and say, no way, Peter, you didn't trust me right now, and you're going to deny me later, so forget it. Or did he essentially do this? Um, Yes, Peter, I'm going to rescue you, but in a minute, I'm going to let you suffer for a little while. In fact, I'm going to splash a little water in your face. Or did he see, snap his finger, and a huge whale came and swallowed up Peter and spit him out on the shore? No, that's Jonah. Or did he D? Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's D. And Jesus is still asking us to cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. Because of this, this week of studying this passage, so I, I can struggle with the tension in, in my prayer life especially, so I've moved to prayer cards which have people and responsibilities and verses, but here's the first one. On the top of my prayer card deck is now this one. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares. And oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I need both these for my prayer life. Cast all your anxieties on him, everything, because he cares. And don't doubt. And oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? Verse 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to to devour. And then verse 9, resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. This is Peter, who went from denying our Lord to, in the the Gospel of Acts, being persecuted, imprisoned, beating, uh, being beaten, and walked away from that, he and other disciples, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Christ. And we see throughout the uh, epistles of Peter, suffering is a theme in there. But verse 10, here's the hope. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And Peter knows what it means to be restored. If you recall, in the very last chapter of the Gospel of John, we have the account right after Jesus' resurrection before his ascension when he appeared to Peter and some of the disciples, and they were back to fishing. But they caught nothing. And Jesus stands on the shore and says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And they did. And bam, it was a fish frenzy at that point. They recognized that it was Jesus. And what does Peter do? He jumps in the water to swim about 100 yards because he can't get to his friend and Savior fast enough. Impulsive? Maybe. Beautiful? Yes. And after Jesus feeds them breakfast, he turns to Peter and asks Peter three times if he loves him, which corresponds with Peter's three denials. And in that moment, Jesus is giving Peter the opportunity to confess his love and reaffirm his call to follow Jesus. And so, I want to close with this thought. We're nearing May and final exams. And so students that are watching, here's your final exam question. And for the rest of us, we're going to just consider this continuing education, and the same question is for us. And this is the question that Jesus gave to Peter. And so hear this as Jesus' question, not just to Peter, but to us. Do you love me? Then clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. And humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, trusting at the proper time he may exalt you. And a second time, do you love me? Then cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And a third time, do you love me? Then be sober-minded and watchful. Resist him, the devil, and stand firm, even in the midst of of suffering. And let's pray together. And as I pray, I want to lead us in a prayer from this passage, but also I want to incorporate um, a prayer that I read recently. John Piper wrote a book on the coronavirus in Christ, and in, he ends this with, with a prayer that I think is a, it's a wonderful prayer that captures the heart of what we as God's people 
can be praying for in this time. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace to us through the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. Thank you for that living hope that we have and that we are being guarded by you. We're being guarded by Jesus as you intercede for us, so we give you thanks. And thank you that you poured out your Holy Spirit to guide us, to strengthen us. Pray that you would continue to mature us as we see the temptations in our lives towards pride and fear and doubt. I pray what would become greater in our lives is the love of the cross, of what you did for us, Christ. And as others have prayed this prayer, Father, at our best moments, by your grace, we are not sleeping in Gethsemane. We are awake and listening to your son's prayer. He knows deep down that he must suffer, but in his perfect humanity, he cries out, if it is possible, let this cup pass. In the same way, we sense deep down that this pandemic is appointed in your wisdom for good and necessary purposes. We too must suffer. Your son was innocent, we are not. Yet with him and our less than perfect humanity, we too cry out, if it is possible, let this cup pass. Do quickly, O Lord, the painful, just, and merciful work you have resolved to do. Do not linger in judgment. Do not delay your compassion. Remember the poor, O Lord, according to your mercy. Do not forget the cry of the afflicted. Grant recovery. Grant a cure. Deliver us, your poor, helpless creatures, from these sorrows, we pray. But do not waste our misery and grief, O Lord. Purify your people from powerless preoccupation with barren materialism and Christless entertainment. Put our mouth out of taste with the bait of Satan. Cut from us the roots and remnant of pride and hate in unjust ways. Grant us capacities of outrage at our own belittling of your glory. Open the eyes of our hearts to see and savor the beauty of Christ. Incline our hearts to your word, your son, and your way. Fill us with compassionate courage and make a name for yourself in the way your people serve. Stretch forth your hand in great awakening for the sake of this perishing world. Let the terrible words of revelation not be spoken over this generation, yet still they did not repent. As you have stricken bodies, strike now the slumbering souls. Forbid that they would remain asleep in the darkness of pride and unbelief in your great mercy. Say to those bones, live, and bring the hearts and lives of millions into alignment with the infinite worth of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And please stand for the benediction. These words of our benediction are from 1 Peter chapter 5. And now hear these words from Peter as the Lord's benediction. And after you have suffered a little while... The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Together, let us sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.